All right, <clears throat> well, let me begin by reading the passage that eventually we're going to expound, okay, which is the um, Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Uh, the reason I want to read this is because it's a commandment to remember a particular day, to remember the Sabbath day, and I'm afraid that we often forget that particular commandment. And I think it's because, again, as we looked at at the uh, beginning of this series, there, there's so much disagreement on the Sabbath. There are many churches out there saying, we, we heard John MacArthur, I didn't hear him, but read a quote from one of his sermons where he says, of all the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment is the only one that isn't moral. It's not a moral commandment and therefore it doesn't continue. But of course, I've been submitting to you the commandment, of course, is moral because it's included among the moral commandments, the Ten Commandments, and because it, it sets the time of worship. Remember, you know, as John MacArthur was saying, well, of course, we need to have God as our God. And of course, we need to worship him as he calls us to worship him. And uh, that would include, of course, keeping our, our oaths and our vows to him. But the fourth commandment, we don't need it because it's not a moral commandment. But the fourth commandment tells us when and it tells us how often we are to worship the Lord. We definitely need this commandment. But as I read it, let's remember that in order to keep this day holy, to set it apart for the Lord, there are certain things we need to set our lives apart from. There are certain things we need to set aside that we might do this, and it certainly includes our work. Uh, Moses writes, actually the Lord wrote this with his own finger on tablets of stone. He says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it <clears throat> you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Remember, the Sabbath was made for man. It was made to be a blessing to man. And the blessing comes from, from setting aside all of our worldly activities and labors to spend it with him. That, that is where the blessing is. And if we don't do that, then obviously we don't receive the blessing, nor do we receive the promised blessing for keeping the Sabbath holy, which we'll look at in the future. Well, as I've said, uh, I wanted to review a little bit what we've been looking at with regard to the Sabbath. And remember, the Sabbath is the day that our Lord calls us to set aside our work and the things in the world that would distract us, including, you know, the sports and recreations, things that we might normally like to do, or even television programs or Super Bowls and things of that nature, so that we can spend the day with Him. In, in public worship, by the way, have you ever asked yourself the question, why do some churches, not too many today, have two worship services on a Sunday and uh, many of them really just have one? Uh, it's because those who have two typically take the, the Lord's Day, the Christian Sabbath seriously and they want to have opportunities for God's people to worship and take advantage of this day. Uh, typically those that have only one, not, not all of them, but typically, those that only have one really don't see the, the Lord's Day as a Sabbath. It's more like the Lord's Hour, uh, the Lord's Worship Service. And, and when we've done our duty, then we can just plunge ourselves back into the world and back into the things that we enjoy. But you see, that way of thinking is, of course, completely wrong. A true believer is somebody whose life is immersed in the Lord and, and in His kingdom. Uh, it's not... I give the Lord the hour on Sunday and the rest of the week and the rest of this day is mine. Our whole lives actually uh, belong to Him. And the Sabbath reminds us of that. Uh, I think it's also an indicator of just kind of where our hearts are at if we actually look forward to it. Now, so what we're trying to do is build a case from the Bible that um, the Sabbath was initiated at creation continued all the way through the, you know, the antediluvian and patriarchal period, even in the garden, I should say, uh, certainly uh, was codified in the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai and continued from there, but continues into the New Covenant as well. Uh, 
Well, we started with the argument from nature, from uh, general revelation and natural revelation, where God shows us not only that He exists, which we saw through our apologetic series, uh, but also that we depend on Him for everything, uh, for our existence and for everything we need to continue from day to day. And all of these things that we receive from this ultimate being basically obliges us, obligates us to worship Him, to thank Him, to honor Him, to, um, to praise Him. And worship is something that takes time. You know, time that, as we saw, needs to be the same for everyone so that we can gather together, so that we don't distract one another from basically what our Lord calls us to do with regard to worship. Now, we've seen as well that natural revelation doesn't tell us uh, how long we should worship. It doesn't tell us how often we should worship. God doesn't show us these things through the creation, but He does show us in His Word. As a matter of fact, He shows us through His pattern of creation and rest. He created the world in six days, which He could have done in an instant. And He rested on the seventh and blessed and sanctified it to give us a pattern. Remember, Augustine asked the question, why would God take six days to do something He could have done in an instant? The answer, he thought, was, well, God did do it in an instant, but He explained it to the angels over a period of six days. Others would say, well, no, he took eons of time, but he explains it to us in six days so that we will keep this pattern. Is there something going on out there that I need to be aware of? Okay, Every, everything's okay? Okay. All right, I see a lot of activity going on. Okay. Well, so did God explain it to us in this way because he wanted to set this pattern, or did he do it in this way? in order to set the pattern. Well, we believe that he actually did it in this way. And he established the Sabbath from the very beginning for man, for mankind. That's why we believe that Adam and Eve kept the Sabbath in that brief time in which they were actually in the garden. Remember, God gave them the command and the blessing to procreate, but Eve didn't conceive while she was in the garden, which means that they weren't in the garden for very long. I would say less than a month. But I say while they were in that month, they were keeping the Sabbath because God had made the Sabbath for them. They didn't just work and they didn't just guard the garden. They didn't just eat and sleep. They also rested and they worshiped the Lord on his holy day. And I think that's where we see that Cain and Abel got the pattern. After all, we see them, remember, bringing their offerings to the Lord in the course of time which literally means in the Hebrew, at the end of days, which is at the end of the week, or on the Sabbath, to worship God. They were following the pattern that their parents gave them. We saw that the godly line kept the Sabbath. They passed on to their children what the Lord had commanded them so that they too might walk with the Lord. Do you think that Enoch, who pleased God so much because he walked with the Lord, never rested and worshipped Him on, on that day? Uh, certainly we believe this is something that was kept up in the godly line. They understood something of the moral commandments of God uh, written on their hearts, but also revealed to them, uh, including the Sabbath. And that's why they were counted righteous is because they lived according to that standard. But again, only by the grace of God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who was yet to come. We saw that Abraham's children likely weren't able to keep that Sabbath when they were slaves in Egypt. Uh, so the first thing that the Lord did when he delivered them out of Egypt was restore that Sabbath. And then to show them and to show us that this was meant to be permanent, he wrote it on the stone tablets on Mount Sinai along with the other nine moral commandments. Okay, so we have ten moral commandments that are meant to be uh, permanent. Now last we saw what the Lord also said through Isaiah in the Old Covenant that when the New Covenant came, and foreigners and eunuchs would be included in the assembly of the Lord. And I believe commentators, at least Reformed commentators, are agreed. It's referring to the blessings of the new covenant. God pronounces a blessing on those foreigners and those eunuchs who will keep the Sabbath. Now this morning what I'd like us to do is to continue to look at further evidence from the New Testament, uh, New Covenant times, that the Sabbath actually does continue. 
Now, I think we should begin with the argument that in the New Covenant, or I should say the New Covenant, uh, far from taking away any obligation to worship the Lord, actually strengthens our obligation to worship Him. I mean, would we want to reason in this way? Now that Jesus, the reality, uh, everything the Old Covenant, the Old Testament was pointing to has come and completed His work, uh, do we no longer then need to worship God? If we take away the Sabbath, essentially that's what we're doing. We have to kind of fit it into the rest of the week because now we don't have that day any longer. I would say that greater blessing argues for a greater obligation. And I think we see the, uh, the New Testament church actually keeping that. You know, we do read in the Bible that, that the disciples uh, went to the synagogues on Saturday and they also worshipped on the first day of the week. They actually ended up keeping two Sabbaths. Of course, the first one was that they might share the gospel with their Jewish brethren who had met together in synagogue. But the second one is that they might meet as the new covenant church and worship the Lord. We also see in Scripture that when the people of God failed to uh, meet in those assemblies, that they were reproved for it and they were encouraged uh, to attend and to make that a part of their commitment to the Lord. The author to the Hebrews writes this in Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Of course, you can't do that if you're not together. He says, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. You see, we, we need this day not, not just to draw near to the Lord, uh, to worship Him and to rest, but we also need it to gather together to encourage one another. We need that encouragement. And so when we're absent from the assembly, we don't get that. At least we don't get that part of it we might otherwise get from those uh, who are here. It's very important. But again, we see the New Covenant Church taking worship seriously and not abandoning worship on that day, but rather giving themselves to it and encouraging one another to do the same. But as I've said, we do have more explicit evidence from the New Covenant. And first, I want us to look at that passage we read earlier from the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said to his disciples, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Now, Jesus tells us here, first of all, that he didn't come to abolish. He didn't come to dismantle. He didn't come to tear down what God had earlier said through the writings of Moses or the prophets or the entire Old Testament. He came to fulfill them. Uh, as I mentioned before, he came to fulfill the ceremonial law. And he did that when he offered himself on the cross, giving that once for all sacrifice to pay for our sins. But we also know that he fulfilled the moral law, the Ten Commandments, through his own perfect obedience in order that he might give to us a perfect righteousness by which we could be justified, we could be just in the sight of God. Now, having fulfilled the ceremonial law, we know that that has been set aside. We, we no longer need to um, do ceremonial rituals, cleansing rituals. We no longer need to bring animal sacrifices to draw near to God. And, you know, thankfully, because Peter refers to that ceremonial law at the Jerusalem council as a yoke placed upon the necks of their forefathers, which he said neither our forefathers nor we have been able to bear. He wasn't saying the moral commandments are unbearable. I mean, John tells us in his first letter the commandments aren't a burden. And the reason why they're not a burden is because, again, by God's grace, He's given us a spirit to give us a love and a desire to keep those commandments, and it's never hard to do what you want to do. But the ceremonial law was a burden. I mean, just when you read, it's a burden even to read what they had to do. Can you imagine having actually to do that? So we don't have to do that. We come through the sacrifice that Jesus has made. But the same thing is not true with regard to the moral law. Jesus kept the moral law, to fulfill it, 
to justify us, but he also kept it to give us the power to keep it. Remember the blessing of the new covenant through Jeremiah by, and quoted by the author to the Hebrews is said to be God's taking the law, the law which Israel did not obey, which are the, the Ten Commandments written on stone. And again, those Ten Commandments written on stone was a ministry of death because it didn't have the power. It couldn't give the people the power to keep them. But in the New Covenant, God gives us the power. The Spirit of God takes those commandments and He writes that law, not on our bodies, but He says on our hearts. He gives us a love and affection for those things, a desire to keep them. And he's again referring here to the Ten Commandments. This is simply an Old Testament way of referring to the ministry of the Holy Spirit who gives us the desire and the ability to keep the law of God so that we will follow the example Jesus gave us. I mean, what is that, that example? Did Jesus keep the Ten Commandments? Yes, of course, all of them. And what does he call us to do? He says, follow me, follow my example, be like me. I've come so that you would be like me. Uh, Paul refers to it as being predestined to become conformed to the image of, of Christ. Okay? That, that is God's plan for us, and that includes obedience. The moral law has not been changed. That's not what Jesus is arguing here. He goes on to say this in verse 18, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. And does he mean by here, until I fulfill it? And then I'm going to do away with it? No, because he goes on to talk about how we need to keep it and teach it. But what does he mean until all is accomplished? Well, he's basically saying until heaven and earth have accomplished their purposes, until everything is fulfilled. Why would, he go on? Why would he say until heaven and earth pass away? Why would he make it so extreme if he was planning on doing away with it within, well, basically um, the next three years, okay? Now, what Jesus is doing here is giving us or saying in the strongest possible way that until God's plan for this present heaven and earth has been completed, the moral law will stand. Even the least of these commandments and that includes the fourth commandment. Now, he further strengthens this interpretation by pronouncing a blessing on those who keep these commandments and teaches others to do the same, all of them, and then what might be considered a curse on those who would set aside even the least of these commandments. He says, whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, let me just ask a rhetorical question. What does that have to say about somebody who would set the Sabbath aside and encourage other people to do the same? Now, Jesus' next statement is actually quite sobering, and I've already referred to this just a bit. He says in verse 20, For I say to you um, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I said before, Jesus, I don't believe, is speaking here about imputed righteousness. I don't think he's saying that unless we trust him and receive his perfect righteousness, we won't enter into heaven, though that is true. Okay? We have to trust in Jesus. We need his righteousness, or we're never going to enter, enter into heaven. But what he is saying here, that is unless our personal level of obedience, how we obey the law, is greater than the most religious and the most scrupulous among the Jews, the scribes and the Pharisees, that we will not enter into heaven. And how could Jesus say something like that? Because, I mean, didn't they, above all people, keep it perfectly? Well, no. The Pharisees, for the most part, only kept the letter of the law. I mean... Jesus goes on to show us where they failed. And he tells us that we need to be better than what they've been teaching and especially what they've been doing. We need to keep the spirit of the law as well. We need to obey him in our words, in our thoughts, and in our hearts, as well as our actions. And again, we know what that means. Don't murder somebody, don't unjustly take away their life, but also don't murder them in your heart. Don't commit adultery, 
in actuality, but don't desire it in your heart either. This is what the Spirit of God gives us the ability to do in the new covenant and why Jesus says that our righteousness must be greater because the Spirit of God will give to us a greater righteousness through His work of sanctification. Now, if the smallest stroke and letter of the law remains in force, as I mentioned before, then so does the Sabbath. If our righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, we must certainly keep the Sabbath. If we're to have the strength that we need to obey God in the way He calls us to and to have this righteousness which is greater than the scribes and Pharisees, we need the Sabbath because that's the time God gives us to draw near to Him, to find the strength that we need in order to serve Him. Okay, it's, it's a blessing. We've got to look at it as a blessing. Now, Jesus further strengthens this view by declaring Himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath. I mean, we don't want to miss that point. When the Pharisees saw His disciples picking the heads of grain on the Sabbath and, they, and accused them of breaking it, Jesus defended them, saying this in Mark 2, 25 through 28. Have you never read what David did when he was in need and he and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests. And he also gave it to those who were with, with him. And again, here Jesus is defending the fact that the disciples are doing something that was necessary to do on the Lord's day. But then he gives them this, this key point. Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. It was meant to be a blessing, not a curse, not a burden to him. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now I want you to notice here that Jesus is correcting their false view of the Sabbath just as he did in the Sermon on the Mount when he deals with other of the commandments. He says, first of all, not that the Sabbath has been abolished or that it would be abolished, but first of all, he says the Sabbath was made for man. And he's talking about something that had been done and something that continued to be. And that was not just for Adam and Eve and not just for the Old Testament church, but not just for the church in general, but for all mankind. Okay, all mankind needs to keep the Sabbath. And he certainly made it for Adam and Eve at the beginning. And it continued to the present. But then he declares himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath. And as the Lord of the Sabbath, He has the right to tell us what should or should not be done on this particular day. And we'll refer to that again when we look at how we are to keep this day holy. Now the question is, why, why would Jesus refer to the Sabbath as, you know, from the creation ordinance that God made it for us and then declare Himself to be the Lord of this Sabbath? when he had come actually to do away with it or to abolish it. Now, here's, here's an interesting question. Do we have Jesus instructing his disciples? Because remember, what, what was the time of preparation for the disciples, you know, to carry on the work that Jesus was doing once he was gone? Wasn't it the training that he put them through for the three and a half years? And wasn't his instruction meant to be the instruction for the new covenant? Wasn't, was he instructing them in old covenant behavior that he was going to abolish? Or was he instructing them in new covenant behavior that was going to continue? Well, I would say that Jesus was instructing them in new covenant behavior. This is what the new covenant is going to be like. And I think we would be hard-pressed to find anything that Jesus taught to his disciples that he later abolished or that the disciples themselves or the apostles as they were writing simply abolished. I mean, more than that, we also have the statement of Christ before he sends them out. He told them before he sent them to make disciples of all the nations in Matthew 28, 20, to teach them to observe all that I commanded you. Okay? I mean, Jesus is basically giving them a comprehensive command. Everything I taught you, I want you to teach them. And that would include what he just said here regarding the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, and the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath, and there are certain things which may be done on that day and certain things which may not be done on that day. You know, Jesus even goes on to say beyond, 
uh, this Mark 2 passage we just looked at in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, when he's telling them what's going to take place in the future in what's called the Olivet Discourse, he says that when that takes place, and by the way, I believe Jesus is referring to 70 A.D., there's a number of people who think that what he's, what he's referring to is still future from our perspective. But from anyone's perspective, it was future from when Jesus said it to his disciples. But he told them in the Olivet Discourse, pray that your flight out of Jerusalem will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. Now, when his judgment comes, Jesus is basically saying, that the disciples will still be observing the Sabbath day. I mean, if, they, if it was just the Jews who were observing it, that wouldn't get in their way. But pray that, you, that you're not engaged on the Sabbath in your worship and rest because that day may catch you, as, you know, it may surprise you and you won't be ready for it. So pray that it's not in the winter where it's difficult to travel and pray that it's not on a Sabbath day when it might catch you by surprise. But the point is, Jesus says, the Sabbath is still going to be something you're observing in the future, okay? And that shouldn't surprise us because he didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it, to give us the power to fulfill it. Now, finally, one last argument. The author to the Hebrews tells us that Jesus, far from abrogating, abolishing, destroying the Sabbath through his work, through fulfillment, okay, actually confirms it, actually uh, establishes it, actually uh, makes it so that it continues. Uh, we read in Hebrews 4, verses 9 through 10. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Now, when you have the time, read this in context, read chapters 3 read, and chapter 4. Um, and see how this argument all fits together. And I'm going to try to explain it, hopefully in a way that isn't confusing. But sadly, some arguments require more than one point. And when you stack a few of them together, sometimes it can get hard to follow. But let's try. Okay. Now, the author first points his readers in, in the context to the Jews under Joshua. That's the reason I read Psalm 95. How they fail to enter into the promised land. Remember that? The promised land he likens to a picture of God's rest, or basically to God's rest, okay? Because the land of Canaan is a picture of, of heaven. It was a picture of, of, of God's rest. But because they did not believe the promise of God that he could bring them in, they failed to enter even into that picture of the promised rest. The author says in Hebrews 3 verse 19, so we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Now, his, his whole reason for making this argument is there were people in the congregation that were beginning not to believe that Jesus is the Christ because of Roman persecution. They were wanting to go back to the Jewish faith because they weren't being persecuted by the Romans. But to do so would be to be like those people who failed to enter into the rest because they didn't believe God's promise. He didn't believe Jesus, in this case, was the Messiah to enter into that rest. So what the author does, secondly, is he points them to the fact that that possibility of entry into God's rest still continued, even after those people who were led by Joshua failed, or not Joshua, but Joshua actually did bring them into the land, but the ones who failed to enter, when they originally brought them to the border of the promised land and they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, okay? Does that mean that the possibility of entering into God's rest ended and nobody was able to enter? Well, no, because he points to something that David wrote in Psalm 95, verses 7 and 8, that indicates that the possibility still exists. David says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Okay, don't be like those that, that didn't believe God and weren't able to enter into God's rest. But if you hear his voice today, don't harden your hearts, but rather trust the Lord, believe, and enter into that rest. Okay? Now, here's the interesting thing. When David wrote that, he was already in the land. Okay? Joshua brought them in. Several generations have passed. David eventually becomes king. 
But he's in the land, he's the king of the land, he's in the picture of the rest, and he's telling God's people, he's encouraging them to enter into that rest. Well, what is the rest that he's referring to if it's not the land? Well, it's, of course, God's eternal rest, the rest that God is the eternal Sabbath that he promised, which is at the end of the week to show that at the end of our lives, we can enter into that rest if we trust in the Lord. Or in our case, in the new covenant, as we're going to see next week, if we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ um, on the first day of the week, uh, we will enter into that rest. So he was encouraging God's people to enter that rest still, even though Joshua had already brought them into the land. And the point is, the land is not the true rest of God. The author writes this in verse 8 of chapter 4, For if Joshua had given them rest, he, that is David, or God through David, would not have spoken of another day after that. Okay? So we're talking about another rest that is possible for God's people to enter into if they have faith. And so then he concludes in this rather odd way. His conclusion starts with a, um, well, basically a therefore, but in verse 9, he says, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Okay, now how does that follow from what he's been arguing? Uh, is he saying, therefore, there, there is still a rest in heaven for us? Well, no, because it's interesting, the word that he uses here, and again, sorry it's getting, if this is getting overly complicated, the word that he uses here for Sabbath is only used once in the New Testament. And I believe that as lexicographers look for other uses of the word, they found only one other use uh, in, you know, in, in that time frame. The word is sabbatismos, and it literally means the keeping of a day of rest. So the author to the Hebrews is concluding that there is a keeping of a Sabbath, a Sabbath rest, which is what the fourth commandment is actually commanding, okay? that that still remains for the people of God. Why? Well, the Sabbath is a picture, as we've already seen, a picture of the rest of heaven that is still ahead of us. Uh, it, it remains because the possibility of entering into that rest still remains. If there was no possibility of entering into the rest of God, then there wouldn't be any need for a picture. The picture, the, you know, the, it be held out as a promise of entering into that rest. But then the question arises, well, why does it continue? Why is there still a possibility? And he argues it's because of what Jesus Christ has done. In verse 10, for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Now, I would um, recommend if, if you uh, have the time and you want to struggle with the language, uh, trying to understand it uh, because it's not easy reading, but I would uh, recommend to you John Owen and his commentary on the uh, book of Hebrews where he builds a very strong argument that that verse is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you just a couple of his many arguments. First of all, he says that this one who has entered into his rest did so in the past from the perspective of of the author to the Hebrews, the one who has entered and continues to be in that rest. And Jesus is certainly the one who has done that. By the time the author writes, Jesus has already ascended into heaven. Secondly, he is said to enter into his own rest. Okay? Now, who can do that but God alone? Well, Jesus can because he is God. He goes on to say that he rested from his works as God did from his. Now, anybody can just stop working, but that's not the same as resting as God rested. When God rested on the seventh day, he looked at everything that he had done and he said, it is very good. Now, we can't, we're not going to be able to do that at any point in our lives. And even when we're in heaven, we're not going to be able to look back over our lives and say, oh, that was all good. Because most of it wasn't good. But everything that Jesus did was good, just like the Father's work. He's able to look at it, take satisfaction in it, and say it is good. And perhaps the major argument is this. It's on the basis of that statement in verse 10 that the author to the Hebrews says that the Sabbath continues. Let me read again verses 9 and 10. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And remember, this is the keeping of a day, 
uh, of rest, a Sabbath day for the people of God for or because the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. In other words, he is basing the continuance of the Sabbath day on what this one did who entered into his, his own rest. So, as you see, far from tearing down the Sabbath through his work, the, the reason why the Sabbath continues, the reason why the picture of the heavenly rest is still held out in front of us as a promise is because of what Jesus has done. He is the one who brings us into that rest. But the point is, the Sabbath day continues on the basis of that work. And again, you know, I wrote a paper for seminary on this, so I kind of got immersed into it, but it's been three decades or so since I actually did that. But as I was looking at this, I was also thinking, you know, the, the, the chapter, chapter 4 ends with the statement, Therefore, since we have so great a high priest who has, who has passed through the heavens, even Jesus, let us hold fast our, our confession. And I'm thinking, therefore, since we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, you know, if you read the book of Hebrews up to that point, there's really nothing said about the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ into heaven unless it's in that verse where the one who has entered into his rest has rested from his works as God did from his. I think that is talking about our great high priest who has passed through the heavens and who now appears before God on our behalf. Okay, so the Sabbath continues, the author to the Hebrews argues, um, because of the work that Jesus Christ has done. Now, I've said a lot, so let me just conclude by summarizing <coughs> Excuse me, what I've said. The greater grace and blessing of the new covenant argues for an even greater need for a day for us to worship and thank the Lord. Greater blessings, greater obligations. Jesus, secondly, tells us that he didn't come to abolish the law, but that the law will continue to be binding, he says, even the smallest letter and stroke, which includes the Sabbath, until heaven and earth pass away, which is when God's plan for this present heavens and earth is complete. Thirdly, Jesus declared himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath. He gave directions on how to keep it, and then he told his disciples to teach these things to the nations, to us. Okay, that was supposed to be instruction coming to us. He told his disciples that it would continue after his death and resurrection when he said that they should pray that their flight out of Jerusalem, which was in 70 AD, would not be in the winter or on a Sabbath day. So it continues. And then finally, the author to the Hebrews tells us that rather than destroying the Sabbath through his work, it's because of his work that it continues. It remains as a picture of the promise that he made, that if we trust in him, if we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ who has entered into his rest, then we will enter into that rest as well through him. Now, there's a lot more that still needs to be said, believe it or not, on the Sabbath. And tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the objections that have been raised against the Sabbath. I think at least four major objections, and I think there are very clear arguments uh, against anything that really contradicts what we've just seen. But remember to keep those points in your mind, as well as what we've seen before. And remember this as well that if you find within your hearts that kind of you know, desire welling up to say, I really don't want to believe this, that's a problem. Okay? It's a problem because, again, even if God had not given us this, this day, our attitude should be this, not that I need to keep a Sabbath and I don't want to do that, but it should be, I wish every day were like this day. And one day it will be. You know, that, that's basically the same thing as saying, like the Apostle Paul, I would rather depart and be with Christ than stay here, okay? Well, depart and to be with Christ is where every day is the Sabbath day, okay? I wish every day were the Sabbath day instead of I wish none of the days were a Sabbath day, okay? It's, it's a blessing, and we need to see it as a blessing. It's a day that we get to spend with God, and so we should count it to be something very precious and something desirable.
And that's certainly what our hearts should be telling us because we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord to um, help us just to think through uh, that, that particular issue as we prepare to come to the table.